Earlier this month, SvelteKit released some major breaking changes that you need to know about if you're going to use SvelteKit. Let's break it down. What's up, everyone? My name is James T. Quick, and I do weekly videos on web development related topics. And I've done a lot with JavaScript. I've done a lot with frameworks and specifically Svelte and SvelteKit. And I am a huge fan of SvelteKit. For uh, those of you who maybe don't know, I've got a couple of videos that you can reference to learn about it. But Svelte is a framework like Angular, React, and Vue. Svelte Kit is now kind of a layer on top of that uh, to give you all the things that you might need to do static site generation, to do server-side rendering, all those things. And it's a really amazing framework. I've got a video uh, several, maybe a year ago, I can't remember how long ago it's been, that I tried uh, Svelte for the first time in Svelte Kit, and I just absolutely fell in love. So I'm a huge fan, and uh, it's still not at a 1.0 yet. They're in the process of kind of, I don't know what the timeline is, but trying to get this thing ready to be an official 1.0, which is really exciting. But that means that there are breaking changes along the way. And uh, I'm kind of in the process with my podcast co-host, Amy Dutton, of releasing content on SvelteKit, a course, a big course. And this makes it pretty challenging because of these breaking changes along the way. So anyway, I thought it would be uh, cool to kind of come on here, walk through these changes and kind of react to them with you so that you can keep them in mind as you go forward using SvelteKit. Now, I'm going to have a, a couple of links uh, in the description below. I think the probably the biggest thing to have is the link to this blog post for, on svelte.dev slash blog. Title is What's New in Svelte, August 2022. 20, uh, it's almost hard to believe uh, this was earlier this month, so almost a month ago on August 1st, and you kind of walk through the changes and uh, some explanations. And the big thing that people have referenced is uh, this uh, this issue on or this discussion on GitHub that kind of walks through a lot of the reasoning or like what the changes are, why we're doing this, etc. And it really gets pretty detailed. So you have a link to both of those if you want to uh, look at those. Uh, but I'm going to walk through this article from uh, my friend Brittany Postma at Netlify, who wrote migrating breaking changes in SvelteKit. So I'll kind of use this as a template and we'll kind of talk through the changes along the way. So overall changes uh, to the load API, they're big changes in layouts and routing uh, to using Vite, et cetera. Um, and I think uh, just looking at the August updates, there were 10 breaking changes. Now, again, this is kind of a hard thing with a framework uh, to have these breaking changes introduced along the way. But again, they're trying to get to this 1.0. So they're making all the necessary changes they feel like are relevant now leading into uh, 1.0 version at some point. So routing, I think, is the biggest thing. And I've got some mixed opinions on this. So uh, so many frameworks now are doing page-based routing, where you have a routes directory, you add in a file, index.svelte, for example, or about.svelte. And those are now uh, hosted as two separate pages. So you have uh, .com slash index or just .com. You have .com slash about, and that happens automatically. Uh, we also had this idea of the double underscore for layouts and errors. Uh, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so we can zoom in a little bit here. Uh, so this is how we did our layouts. Uh, you could do nested layouts and you could do your error components uh, with this double underscore thing. You could also have nested routes inside of a directory. Uh, so this page based or file based routing uh, now is kind of going away in the format that you knew. So now instead of just having an individual file, where you can name it what you want. Everything is based on a folder. So all new routes need to be in a folder. Now, to me, this adds a little bit of overhead of, um, of your file system, right? You're having to add new folders when you didn't have to before. So if you look at this example above, for about, you'd have to create a new folder called about, and then inside of it, create a page plus page dot spell. So plus is gonna be a reserved uh, kind of key character in here. The router now, uh, or SvelteKit, is going to look inside of your uh, routes directory. It's going to look for uh, files that match this format of plus page, and then it's going to host those as pages. So here's the example of what we had above. So at the index, you'll have uh, the plus page. You can have your plus layout, plus error. So notice again that plus syntax is going to be the differentiator. Inside of your about, about directory, the about page is going to be plus page dot again and layout, etc. So this means that you're going to have uh, lots of plus page felt uh, components inside of your pages. You're also going to have more directories. One of the benefits of this, though, is that you can do stuff like co-locate an individual component 
with your route. So in this case, coc dot uh, svelte, this I assume is code of conduct dot svelte. This is a regular svelte component that traditionally you would have put like in a separate components directory. But now you can co-locate this inside of the about directory because this component's only used with the about page. So it makes sense to kind of co-locate it there. And svelte kit is only going to pick up pages as plus page dot, dot svelte. So this means now you can co-locate those components. It's more clear what exactly is a page component. It's very explicit here. Uh, but I think I think the routing, the the folder structure adds some overhead, it adds some complexity. You've got a lot of plus page felt, plus layouts felt, et cetera. But from a searching perspective for your files, you can still search for about and then just do about and type in page if you're in VS Code or something. The search actually works. Uh, pretty good. So uh, she's saying it makes uh, it's much clearer what route each file is attached to in the new routing system. So everything's nested inside of those directories. Uh, this is a big change. I think people will have mixed opinions on this. Um, I've definitely got mixed opinions on this. I think it's something that we will continue to get more used to, but it does help add some clarity about what the route is, what the page route is for that route or the page component is for that route. And then also the benefit of being able to co-locate regular Svelte components is pretty neat. So uh, we'll have a link to this article as well. And this one has a ton of different links in it. So uh, Brittany did a great job of going through and breaking this out. So layouts, uh, layouts have been overhauled as well as you kind of saw just a second ago. Um, so we could do things like have underscore underscore layout dot svelte. And then we could have nested one of ones of those if we put it inside of another directory. We could also then give uh, named layouts by doing underscore underscore layout dash nested or whatever that name is. And then we could reference that thing by uh, calling or inside of the route file name doing at and then the name of the layout. Uh, so notice that nested and nested match here. So this is how we could do that before. Um, layouts and nested layouts in Svelte, I think were, or Svelte kit were one of the things that were done really well that people really liked. And it's really powerful once you get used to that. So this is going to change a little bit. So uh, again, your uh, your plus layout dot svelte, that's going to be a reserved kind of file name that svelte kit is looking for. And you can have one of those inside of each folder along the way. Remember, we're doing folder based routing. So now inside of the about folder, you can have your a new plus layout dot svelte, and this will inherit the parent and it'll keep going down where they're nested and nested and nested. Now, the way this works is that uh, layouts are going to typically have or like have to have a slot component inside of them. So you define some sort of markup and then in the middle of that is going to be the slot, which is the actual um, component for the page. So that would be uh, the page component would actually go in the slot. So now you can nest these further and further and further, which is pretty cool. Now, this is something that really seems intimidating to me, and I can't even quite wrap my head around the group layouts. But you can do a parentheses syntax and then have a layout associated with the parentheses and then have that be applied to all of these. This is kind of interesting to me and almost like we're getting into weirder and weirder folder names with, uh, you know, the brackets for dynamic API routes and things like that. And now parentheses to group these. So this is actually new to me. I haven't actually used this at all. Um, so that seems kind of intimidating, to be quite honest. Um, but let's see, so a file can be added to a group directory if the uh, slash or a home route should be the group. Okay, so new convention to share layouts with a folder wrapped in parentheses called a group directory. Now, I think the use case for this is if you have something like uh, slash dashboard slash and then the different pages of the dashboard, then you can have, uh, have those be grouped and share that layout between uh, those different pages. So that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, that's probably the weirdest syntax. I think that's out there. So you can go in and kind of look into that. Now, another thing that has changed is the load functionality. So load in SvelteKit was the ability to uh, load some sort of data from a database or a CMS or something or wherever, really make a fetch API request to get some data. You could load those things. Uh, and then uh, when you call this page, it would run that on the server. Uh, if you load that page from scratch, so if you're loading a page from scratch and it has a load function, it would load that data on the server and then send that to the browser. But if you go from page to page, it would actually run that code um, in the browser. So that load functionality would run on the browser and on the server. 
which kind of complicated things. And you had to kind of specifically understand uh, where where that code would be running specifically with environment variables to make sure that you're safe with those. So in the past, uh, you could put that load function just inside of a route. Um, and there's little ambiguity again of like, where does this stuff actually run? And it was always a little bit of a weird syntax to me where you'd have like the script with a context of module and define your load function. And then also your regular script, which would be like what you're used to with a regular kind of bland svelte component. Anyway, the load function has moved into the endpoint file and the magical loading of data in the svelte file still exists and passes to the route with the data prop. So this is if you want to associate uh, some amount of data with a page, uh, there's some magic that can happen to have that kind of be auto populated. And you can see an example down here where you can have a, um, you can add your load function to a page.svelte or a page.server.js. Uh, so the page.svelte, it would load data and, and pass that to your component. If you are uh, doing page.server.js, this is important because this will only run on the server. And I think this has been referenced in kind of other ecosystems of the dot server dot something and clarifying that that thing is only running on the server. That actually is very useful to know for API key secrecy, knowing where to put your environment variables, your secret keys, et cetera. Uh, so there's new syntax for getting that uh, load data into your component. Now, regardless of which one of these you use, so either inside of the page.js or the page.server, you have this load function, it's going to then come in as a prop called data. Uh, so you're gonna get that data, then you can use it inside of your component, which is cool. Uh, there's some updates to uh, how individual pages are, um, are rendered. So there's pre-rendering, hydration, and then I'm not actually sure what the uh, what the router piece is there. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe somebody can help me in the details. Uh, and then also the cool thing here is an update with Vite. So the SvelteKit Vite integration has now become a SvelteKit plugin, I believe, with Vite. Or yeah, so SvelteJS Kit Vite. So it, now it's just a plugin for Vite. And I think there's a cool uh, cool line here where uh, Brittany says that SvelteKit is just a Vite project that uses that plugin. So Vite is becoming more and more of a standard. It's becoming more and more popular, which is great to see. It's absolutely fantastic. It's super fast and it's growing in popularity. And now SvelteKit is just embracing that to a new uh, new level. So instead of kind of the old way here where there's uh, these different things that you have to configure, now we're just configuring, we're adding the SvelteKit plugin uh, and then we're uh, adding that into the Vite configuration and now it's kind of done. Now, one interesting thing, I forget the exact number, but by default, when you ran a SvelteKit project uh, with NPM run dev, for example, uh, it would run by default on port 3000. Now it runs on like 5170 or something. It's kind of a random port, at least in my mind. So that's kind of interesting. It's not really a big deal, but if if you're running now a new project with this updated V configuration, just know that like, look at look in the, I think it's 5173, but look in the terminal to see what, uh, what port it's going to run that on. So lastly, if you're going through migrating changes, I haven't used this at all, so I have no idea how good or reliable this is, but there, uh, there's a Svelte migrate routes command that you can run that will help do this migration for you. There's a couple of steps that she walks through in here. Um, I'm kind of, I, I would be intimidated about this to be quite honest. Like I I'm sure the tool is good. Um, I haven't used it, so I can't say good or bad, uh, but it seems like there's a lot of changes in here to take into account. But anyway, they have some stuff set up for you to um, to help with the migration. So you can try that on a project. I would do it in a separate branch to make sure that you uh, don't mess up your main branch as best you can. So do it in a separate branch, test it out, make sure it's working, merge that thing back in. But anyway, those are the major breaking changes for SvelteKit. Uh, overall reaction, I think some of the syntax stuff is changing in a way that makes me uncomfortable, but I think it's something that I and we and you probably will continue to get used to the more and more we use it. I think every new syntax is really confusing for us at first when it seems foreign, uh, but it's something that we get used to over time. So I'm optimistic about that. And more importantly, I'm optimistic about the fact that like these are changes that the SvelteKit team feel like are necessary to, uh, to, to take the next step and get ready for this 1.0 version. So I think that 
Again, I have no idea on a timeline, but I think this puts us one step closer to officially re releasing 1.0 for uh, Svelte Kit, which will be an exciting times. So anyway, I'm curious what you think about these changes. What are your opinion on kind of the folder base uh, routing, the uh, integration, more direct integration with Vite as a plugin, the load functionality? Let me know what you're thinking about Svelte Kit and how you feel about it in the comments below. Hopefully you're excited about it as well. But that is going to wrap up this video and I will catch you in the next one.